story, there was nothing. And I think I'm going to, um, it's best if I just draw a quick little thing here, then we can explain it as we go. probably wondering what this is. <clears throat> this is, at the very beginning, the Big Bang, what scientists call the point of singularity. Now what we're looking for here isn't preciseness, it's not exactly how many years. What we're looking for is a pattern. Because if we can find a pattern to an evolving consciousness, we can apply that pattern to what's happening today and see where it might be leading us. So in the beginning, there was nothing. And right after the Big Bang, this explosion that was so dynamic, so powerful, so forceful, that all of the movement, everything that we see in manifestation, is the outcome of that energy. So right after that, there was a period where everything was so hot, so dense, and so compacted that nothing could take place. But soon after that, after things expanded, cooled down a little bit, there came a time when the two first forces could come into play, and that was the strong and weak nuclear forces. Now here's the first sign of a pattern. There seems to be a pattern of consciousness coming into form and organizing itself into these first little units. Now soon after that, these first little units came into form and formed the first molecules. And the first molecules, after there was enough of them, came together and formed the first cells. Now the first cells was the first time we have anything that appears like life. But again, we see this pattern of smaller units evolving to a, a point of complexity to where they evolved all they can. And at that point, they reach out energetically to other like units to form the next higher level of complexity. Now, this just keeps on going until we form organisms. So about three and a half billion years ago, we had our first organisms on this planet that evolved in a natural process. The organisms have, e have been evolving. Now, there's been a lot of interaction with that evolution, and I, I actually wish we had time to get into that, but we don't. So let's just say that we, we have evolved to this point through whatever processes. Now we've noticed something, because we have evolved, we have our fingers and toes, and we have evolved physically about as much as we can evolve. We really don't need to evolve physically anymore, but what we've noticed is that there's a conscious evolution going on, and it started a long time ago. If, if I get too precise, I'm going to have to explain it. But let's just say that we have seen evolutionary jumps. Like anybody that studies evolution can tell you that it's not a sequentially graduated step. Evolution takes jumps, and nobody can explain that. Nobody can really explain why those jumps take place. But if you look back in time, you can see that those jumps take place usually at a point of transformation where units have evolved to this complexity to where they've reached out energetically and came together to form another higher unit. So what, all, what does all this mean to us? You probably wondered, like, what am I getting at here? What am I getting at? What's the important thing about this? Well, look around at the planet today and look what's going on. 
we are in the middle of chaos. Whether we like to admit that or not, it's chaos. But I'd, I'd like to show you, uh, tell you a little story that Bruce Lipton told me that really helped to clarify this. And it's the story of a caterpillar. We all know what happens to a caterpillar. Well, part of that process, a caterpillar lives its life, it's just thinking everything's great. But then all of a sudden it has this inner feeling to do what it does, make a cocoon, and it's in its cocoon, and it's really nice and safe. And that goes on for quite a while. It's just laying there, and it's thinking everything's great. But all of a sudden, it starts realizing that the inner processes of its biology is breaking down. It's turning into complete chaos. It's just a larva mess. But deep within that chaos, there is a pattern. There's a pattern taking place, and within that pattern, it forces all of that chaos into place. And we all know the eventual story of a butterfly. And I think if we look at our world that we live in, we can see the chaos. But if we don't get caught in the fear, and we just take a deep breath and look at it for what it is, I think we will see that there is a, a pattern underneath all of that chaos. And if we can just identify with the pattern and move on, we will go to the next higher step. Now, what do you think the next higher step would be for us? Anybody have an idea? Okay. If, unless, I mean, unless we are the best that the universe can come up with, you know, if evolution stops with us, well, we're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> but assuming that the universe can do a little bit better than us, and if we apply this pattern to that, what the next step would be is for us to energetically reach out to other human beings of like mind and energetically connect with them to form a planetary consciousness. And then we would be part of a global brain. Now this isn't new, what I'm talking about, this is very old, like Pierre de Chardin used to write about this a lot, he called it the new sphere. And the new sphere is like a biosphere around the planet, and almost every avatar, every messiah, everybody that's become enlightened has glanced this oneness that we're headed for. They can't explain it exactly. They all have different perceptions of it. But we are heading towards a oneness. Now on the outer level, we can see on the outer world, this is already taking place. Like it started back with the Gutenberg Press when we started pressing out people's thoughts where other people could think about what people were thinking about. That was the, like a first sign that we're starting to reach out. Then came the post office and the Pony Express and the mail services and now the internet. If something happens right out here on the Esplanade, the whole world can know about it in 10 seconds. I mean, we're starting to connect already, but that's just the outer manifestation of what's happening on a spiritual level with spiritual consciousness already starting to connect. Now, if we, if we do connect and form a global brain, a planetary consciousness, it only stands to reason that things, divisive beliefs, like most of our religions are divisive. Most of our, all of our countries are divisive. They're nationalistic boundary lines. A lot of these things are going to have to change. A lot of them are going to have to dissolve a lot of long-held beliefs, beliefs that we fought and killed for, and, and today we're still doing it. But those beliefs are going to have to take a back seat to this consciousness. And it's much like, I don't think they're going to stand a chance. It's like waking up of a morning and you have all of these powerful, powerful dreams. And it doesn't matter how powerful those dreams are. When it comes time to wake up, they're gone. You wake up. And likewise with a dream, when we're having a dream, there's many, many, many people in our dream. Many people. But when we wake up, how many of us are there? Just one. And I think we're, when we wake up to our true being, we will find that there's going to be another level of awareness, another level of consciousness beyond anything that's ever been in our history. 
and it would be hard to even pretend I could put words on it that could portray it, but we all feel it, we all sense it. Now, <clears throat> take this a little bit further. Okay, now I'm going to take this pattern and push it up into the future. So, what would it mean if we do become a planetary consciousness? What, what does it mean? Like, if this planet really is a cellular organism, which it seems like scientists are all coming to the conclusion it is, because it has circulatory systems of oceans and wind currents and forests that produce everything, this seems to be a self-regulating biological being that we inhabit. So if that's true, that also means that our solar system is just a larger reflection of that same biology. Now if that's true, which I have no reason to doubt, that means that the next step is us for a planet would be to reach out into our solar system to other planets that have attained some kind of awareness and go into solar consciousness. And this has been talked about by people like Madame Blavansky and Alice Bailey and all of these people around the turn of the century, they started intuitively recognizing that we're heading towards some kind of a level of solar consciousness. Now if we become solar conscious, that means that we're conscious within our solar system. That's true cosmic awareness. And I'm sure at that point we would look back at all of our little individual selves, the way we look back in a dream and just shake our head if we had a head, you know? But with that kind of awareness, we would realize the ridiculousness of 99% of the energy that we expend with nationalistic thoughts and everything else that we do. So, if we're solar consciousness, now I'm going to get a little bit out in shaky ground here, but if we're solar consciousness and this pattern keeps up, what is the purpose to life? If, if now we become conscious within a solar system, we would reach out to other solar systems that have also attained the same level of awareness, which means that we would eventually become galactically aware. And if we become galactically aware, it only stands to reason that we would reach out to other galaxies. And eventually we would be back universally aware back where we started from probably, except span, expanded out over the universe with trillions and trillions and trillions of lives and experiences and who can even imagine what that would be like. And the purpose to this is to go back now, just sort of walk backwards in time to where we are right now and it helps you put into perspective what, what is really important. Is it our little individual lives is it our individual countries? Where, where does it stop? Where does it stop? Let me see if I'm missing anything here. How could I miss anything? I just talked about the whole universe. Here's a quote from Einstein, sort of important, especially seeing the state of the world. Problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. And that's what we're talking about, increasing our level of awareness. Because if we keep trying to solve the problems from the same level of awareness that we're at, we just keep exacerbating the same problems. It just doesn't work. I have down here some of the people I've interviewed about this. Neil Donald Walsh, Bruce Lipton, Lynn McTaggart, Gary Zukoff, Fred Allen Wolf, Peter Russell, Joe Dispenza, uh, James Redfield, Mariana Williamson, Shakti Gwain, and the list goes on. And they all are sensing this. I mean, I, I've heard Deepak talk about it, Wayne Dyer. Here's a little interesting thing, too. If the Encyclopedia Britannica did a little uh, survey, and what they did was they accumulated all of the information that they knew that we had and put it into bits of information. It was like trillions and trillions of bits. 
and they went all the way back to the beginning of what they could see recorded history was, which is about 6,000 years ago. And if you take all of those bits of information for 6,000 years up to 1900, it's a lot of bits. Now if you, if you go from 1900 to 1950, we accumulated that same amount of information again in 50 years. Now if you go from 1950 to 1970, we accumulated that same amount again. And if you go from 1970 to 1980, we accumulated the same amount again. And now we're accumulating information so fast that NASA's years and years behind even putting it into the computers. And the point to this is we are evolving so quick, it's no wonder that so many people are out of touch with what's really going on on the planet. Because if you don't, like, dedicate yourself to finding out about this stuff, the first thing you know, somebody's up here talking in front of you, and it's not making any sense at all. But if you're keeping up with what's happening, you can see that we are evolving, and we are evolving quickly. Before I go on, does, does anybody have any questions? If you guys have no questions, I would question my answers. <laughs> funny, you know, you, you make all these plans, and I don't think I've covered hardly anything in here. <laughs> the problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, but wise people are so full of doubts. Bertrand Russell. I'm going to read a poem that I wrote in 1976. It's about, it's about beliefs. And uh, I, I, looking back at my life, I'm glad that I wrote things when I was so much younger because I can see that there's been a pattern to my life, too. Caught in make believe. Life is easy the way we try. Believe it all and never ask why. I know it's hard to give this thought. It's make believe and you know you're caught. One man believes what another man knows, but faith and truth is true when it flows. We stand on faith when we have no ground. The fear to lose it is we might fall down. But what's its use? To fall we should. For if it's not true, then what's its good? So faith is just another word you use to protect your lies that you fear you'll lose. And if you're not careful and refuse to see, you'll lose yourself and start a war with me. I think that's what happens a lot of times, too. Somebody bound to have a question. Uh, let's see if I can formulate this. Is in, in a minute there, during your talk, you uh, sort of alluded to, oh, if we don't do something fast, blah, 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 blah. blah. And I'm, my question has something about um, that anxiety that's within us about and whether or not that anxiety is actually useful for this conscious You know, I'm questioned about this because I, I'm supposed to be like spiritual. And I've had to think about this several times because there's different lines of thought. There's people that just think totally positive and that's it, you know. That's all we have to do. And I'm all for that. I think we all need to do different things. But in the Middle East, they have a saying, believe in Allah but tie up your camel first. <laughs> And I'm up the camp, but there's a balance. Like this highway out here, I could safely say that I could just cross that highway and make it, but not to the point where I keep my eyes closed. And then if I just open my eyes, it doesn't mean I'm being negative or putting a negative influence on it. Does yeah. that answer? Uh, a little bit, um, but so that little anxiety there that we feel, you know, about things, if some of us who do feel it, I certainly feel it, um, it, it is maybe a useful... Yeah, you can use it. That's energy. And if you look at it, embrace it, you can use it because that is something in us that's trying to transform. And, and I think it's probably worth, noteworthy to, to mention too, that we've been listening out there for other planets for a long time. 
And so far, we don't, don't seem to be getting too many signals. And Carl Sagan said that it could be that most evolutionary planets going through their technological adolescence blow themselves up. And if we think for a second that we're beyond that, we have to remember that 98% of everything that's ever existed on this planet is now extinct. And now we have the capabilities of completely wiping out mankind, not only by overt actions, but by taking no action at all. Just through apathy, we could blow this planet up. And it's not meant to create anxiety. And if I'm not careful here, I'm going to get into this realm of beliefs that I told myself that I wasn't going to do. But it, th this is the thing. I was listening to Phil Donahue talk the other day. And he said, you know, all of my life I've just been sort of quiet because I'm a progressive person. And I noticed that the only people who are talking are fanatics and extremists. He says, we need to start talking and not be afraid. I mean, we've made it against the law. They can't crucify us. They can't burn us at the stake anymore because we can send them to jail. So we've, we have a certain amount of freedom that has evolved in society to give us a little bit of latitude to where we can stand up here and talk like this because 500 years ago, my life would be ending tonight. It, it would be over. So things have, we are evolving in that sense. Now whether we're evolving fast enough, that's the question. And I think it's up to every single one of us to do whatever it is we can do from the perceptual angle that we're at, whatever the job is that we're doing, healing others, bringing this enlightenment, whatever you can do to bring people into the light of consciousness. Because if we don't, well, I don't know what would happen. But I'm sure the universe would go on without us without a glitch. I mean, when you stop and think about the fact of how big we are, this, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny planet in a tiny, tiny galaxy in the far corners of the universe. So it's only human arrogance that thinks that we have to make it. If we make it, it's going to be because we want to make it and we all start pulling together and do it. Any more questions? Um, actually, what you're saying, Rahasha, reminds me of something I recently read that if you were to condense human time, all the billions of years, into one day, every three minutes we would be getting hit by a meteorite in a 24 hour, even in a 24 hour. So just, it just it supports what you're saying that we're really nothing, ultimately. Yeah, if, if you would condense the whole of reality back to just the Big Bang, to which 20, is only into 24 4 billion hours. years ago. If you would condense it to one year, well, we've only been like on the planet for the last 15 or 20 seconds. I mean, that has to be humbling in itself. Well, we're newcomers to this. And look what we've done to this planet. When we first came to the United States, Indians were here for 15,000 years. And you couldn't even hardly tell they were here. Look what we've done in 200 years. This is not sustainable by any stretch of the imagination. Our, our total way we look at life, ourselves, and life, everything needs to change. And that's going to come at a cost. And the cost is going to be some of the beliefs that we have been dragging along with us since the Iron Age. You know, th this planet is organized around beliefs that emanated from the Iron Age. I mean, we have to really think about that. Any more questions? I think that'll do it for me. Oh, what? A question. So, what, I know I missed a little bit. I hope I didn't miss this piece. That, what do, how do you best propose besides networking? This is it. This is it. <laughs> Talking about it, putting light on it, and sharing. This is how it happens. It resonates. Like, like they've done these tests with cells, and they've noticed that a cell that is degenerating or not quite right, other cells will get around it and vibrate. And I think that that's what we're doing. Sometimes we do it with healing, sometimes we do it with information, sometimes we do it with relationships, but we're trying to heal each other and through that resonance and, and we, we will bring people up and ourselves too. What, what is your um, idea about the eternality of the individual spirit?
spirit and how does that play into um, your solutions? You know what? I, I have a good question. I have a good answer for you. I don't know. <laughs> and the older I get, the more comfortable I'm getting. That's a good question because there was a guy named um, Ernest Becker and he did this whole study on people and he realized through the studying that most of our religions, most of our nationalism, everything is an outer projection of us trying to gain immortality because we're scared to death that we are mortal beings. But the truth is, we don't know. Nobody really knows. And I think the trick is now is to get the spiritual awareness to walk in the mystery and be comfortable with that and not have to make up a belief to cover our not knowing. Because if you stop and think about it, I mean, what is the definition of a belief, if we're honest? It's a thought that we have over and over and over. And the thought in the beginning is we're just pretending like we know something. And we keep pretending and we keep having the thought long enough to we, we stop, we, we forget we started pretending in the first place. And then it becomes a full-on belief that we live it out in our lives and we organize our whole life around these beliefs. But historically speaking, almost every belief that human beings have ever had has turned out to be wrong or at the very best misleading. So we need to really be not so arrogant about our beliefs, about how we see life. And does that answer the question? I, I just enjoy living in the mystery now and searching and asking questions like the one you just asked and being comfortable with saying, I don't know. I don't know. And isn't that great? That we can be in a reality and be finally comfortable with not knowing. Because we have to be careful because our minds, the neurological makeup of our minds, if you look at any aspect of our senses, like our vision, as, as you look out, there's a blind spot there and a blind spot there. But what does our minds do? It fills in the blind spot because our minds does not like puzzles. It likes to put things together. And I think when we look out in our world, that same neurological networking translates over into our thinking and our mental cognitive process. And when we get to a point to where we don't know, that's the limit of our understanding. And it's, it's at that point we start making beliefs and pretend like we know what's going to happen the rest of the way. And we don't. You know, we don't know. I, I appreciate what you're saying about enjoying the moment, enjoying your life right now, even though you're bringing this message of we have something to do, because I think that that is what life is about, is enjoying and love and all this good stuff, too. And uh, sometimes it seems like this whole um, the, uh, a drive or maybe a passion on some people's parts to make sure we survive as we know it is kind of ego-based. Yeah, Al almost every institution that we have, is, I don't know if you've ever heard of Gary Zukoff, he wrote the Dancing Wooly Masters, Soul Stories, but he was telling me if you look back in history, you'll notice that almost every single organization and institution we have was built from an ego base to begin with. And if it's ego based, it's going to be built in such a way that it's defensive. And if it's defensive, it can easily get aggressive if it's threatened. And that's what our countries are based on, what our religions are based on, what our corporations are based on. And Even our peace groups. Yeah, our peace groups. I mean, we get out there and fight for peace. They keep fighting against Yeah, yeah. We need to enter into a realm of cooperation instead of competition. And creation. And creation. Because uh, if, if my body was in conflict, if, if my bloodstream thought it was the elite part of my body and fought against the liver or fought against the kidneys or thought the heart was just like beating out of time and had all this conflict, I, I would die. But it works in perfect unison because it works together as one body, one mind, one soul, and eventually I think we will work together as one planet in such a way that I mean, I, I'm sure that it would be difficult to even imagine what a world could be like with us all being conscious, awake, enlightened beings. And I, I think at that point, too, we're going to resonate this out into the universe 
And if there is any other people, or see, that's my human arrogance, if there are any other beings out there, I'm sure that that's what they're waiting for before they make any kind of overt contact with us. We got to get along with ourselves first before we can ever expect to be welcomed out into the galactic neighborhood. Who is your favorite author right now? Probably Schopenhauer. You know, he's, uh, he was pretty interesting. My, my favorite author right now that's alive today is probably Bruce Lipton and um, Candace Pert. Because they, they talk about this extensively. Candace Pert, she wrote Molecules of Emotion. And we're starting to realize now, every time I have an emotion, a fear emotion, a love emotion, anything. It creates a certain peptide soup with hormones and everything. And those hormones and peptides plug right into the cell wall in opiate receptors, the same opiate receptors that accept drugs. So we actually get addicted to feeling love. Like I, I've known people that's addicted to falling in love, but they're not addicted to staying in love. And I've run into a couple. You know, and, and they, it's great for a little while, but they enjoy the, the emotional chemistry of falling in love. But then that doesn't last too long because, you know, your body equalizes to that and then you have to change. Some people are addicted to feeling sorry for themselves. You know, they constantly, and here's where it gets dangerous because 95% of us is all of our actions are dictated by unconscious tapes and patterns. So if I'm standing up here feeling sorry for myself or, you know, thinking that things always happen to me, you know, I'm going to trip and fall or something. I'm going to do something in my environment to kick in the situation that's going to kick in that emotion so I can get my addiction fed. So that's another reason why it's important to really look at yourself, what your actions are, what you're doing, and just information can really help. Coming up in the, as interviews in the Lotus Guide. Well, Joe Dispenza again. He's coming up, and I'm, we're going to try to interview, believe it or not, the mayor of Chico, because I, we see Chico is really in a prime position to take some initiatory steps towards sustainability, and that's what it's all about. I mean, we've got to walk our talk, and the Chico people have it in them to do it. So we're going to talk about the mayor with that and try to get his feelings on that. We're going to interview Kenny Grossman with Sierra Nevada Brewery. Like we recently went to the sustainability meeting here and it was really interesting. Something funny too because the water company people there, the energy people were there, all the trash people, everybody. And guess who was there? The, a representative for Walmart. So. Walmart is this representative is talking about how great Walmart is and what they're doing for sustainability, which is basically having their employees come to work 10 minutes early and talk about how to save cans and stuff, you know. So he, uh, he says, who here has uh, shopped at um, Walmart in the past week? In this week. Um, who, who shopped at Walmart in the past month? He says, boy, this is unusual. Um, who here shops at Walmart ever? You know, like, and I think three people raise their hand, sort of like, you know, I went there to get toilet paper or something. But that, that's a sign of this community, because we know, I, I was reading this report, when you buy a tomato that's been shipped in from overseas, that tomato is costing us over $100. Even though it's cheaper at the grocery market that we're buying it from, it's costing us over $100. And how that happens is we have big corporations that are going into our government and bribing them, and our government is supplementing all of these huge corporations that go all the way around the world, bring in all this junk, plastic stuff, and everything else. They're getting supplemented to bring this stuff in. 
and we're paying for it with our taxes and hydrocarbon units and everything else. Like right now, it used to cost $330,000 a day for one of these big tankers to operate. Now it's costing a million dollars a day, and they sit in the harbor, sometimes for a week, because of our homeland security. So we've built ourselves a system that simply isn't working, and it's going to get worse. Have you guys seen uh, Garbage Warrior by any chance? You should try to see that. It's about this guy who's talking about how to build houses out of stuff that people throw away. He went over to the tsunami area, and the people in the tsunami area heard about this guy because he builds houses out of tires and cans and bottles. And so they called him over there, and they said, hey, what do we do with all this stuff? He said, build a house out of it. Yep, and they started building houses out of all this stuff that they didn't even know what to do with. And he's figured out a way to keep a house at 70, 72 degrees year-round in Taos, New Mexico, where it gets really hot and really cold. And if we keep, but he had to break rules to do this. He had to break building laws and codes and everything else. And finally, New Mexico stepped up and said, okay, we're going to give you this, this piece of land and you can do your experimenting on it. You know, and like he told them, hey, you give big pieces of land to people to drop atomic bombs on to experiment. Surely you can make a piece of land where we can do some building because I don't know. You know, I'm going to make mistakes. So how can I have a code to build by it? But now he's doing really good. Is he on television? He said see it, or is it Yeah, uh, well, I'm sure he's probably at Netflix and things like that, but right now he's on uh, that Channel One on Comcast. You know, if you look on the free movies, he's, it's on there. Garbage Warrior. Earthship houses. He started the Earthships. Yeah. But, he yeah, started yeah. the Earthships. Yeah, he houses. does the Earthships. Yeah. Yep. Is that it? Any other questions? <laughs> you don't have a question, man? You have a burning question, as they say. Uh, when's your next book going to be done? Well, it's up to about 80,000 words right now. And I, I'm, I've rewritten the uh, foreword like three or four times because I'm told that writing a book about beliefs in a society that is totally organized around beliefs, that I'm either preaching to the choir, the people don't buy it, they already agree with it, or the people that I really want to reach won't buy it, won't read it. So I'm in the process of trying to write an introduction in such a way that it's a safe entryway into that without being conflictive. Because the truth is, is we're all in this together. And so I would say, I, I'm really shooting for July to have a, a at least a downloadable PDF, you know? And I'm going to start putting it out like that, then start sending it to publishers. Anything else? Thank you. So are you staying really, 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 really busy these days? Yeah. Um, yeah, this, um, 